2.7 billion working age adults don't have access to formal financial services. Poor families in the informal economy need financial services as much as everybody else. Actually, they need them more for two reasons. A, their uh, income streams and expense outlays are very erratic and not as neatly aligned as, uh, as ours. Uh, I get a monthly paycheck and then I pay my rent or my mortgage a few days later. So very nice synchronization, if you will, of my income stream and my expense stream. Poor people don't have that in the informal economy. And on top, they have less of an economic cushion to begin with. So we know conceptually they need financial intermediation, arguably more so than, uh, uh, than uh, their, uh, their counter richer counterparts in the developed world. And uh, we know empirically that they use a lot of financial services. They live astonishingly rich financial lives. That's what the entire financial diary, diary literature tells us. And what they have to do, because they don't have access to formal financial services, they use informal financial services. And those tend to be unreliable and more expensive. So there's a double injustice, if you will. They need the broad range of financial products. They need some credit to build assets, buy the cows or the guinea pigs, and then build the stable um, uh, for, for the livestock. So they need credit for that. Um, they should protect that investment, so they need insurance, cattle insurance or some such thing. They often uh, uh, care a lot uh, about, not often, all parents care a lot about their education, the education of their children. So they often have to pay for school fees. Um, that is something. You know, school fees are cash flow spike, but non, uh, not an unanticipated one. So how come people borrow and pay interest to pay school fees rather than saving and earn interest while they are saving? Maybe it has to do with the fact we didn't provide the right product, which is a commitment savings product, or we didn't find the business model who can actually deliver those savings at low enough costs. If you now switch over to the provider side, the supply side, if you will, the, the provider economics per product or by product are very, very different. And the economic challenge is very, very different. And as a result, you can't expect one set of uh, institutions to provide all these services. What you need is a, an ecosystem of a variety of financial services providers that all work together. The promise of technology and in particular cell phone enabled new business models is to bring down transaction costs to this incredibly low level so that payment services and, uh, and uh, short-term high-frequency savings services become economically viable from a provider perspective. But it's very important to distinguish what we exactly are talking about. So we are talking about payments here, mobile money, but not necessarily banking. Because banking includes, obviously importantly, the extension of credit. And that you would never do over the mobile phone, right? You need to still under assess the credit risk and make sure you know the borrower very well. Again, I'm speaking from a provider perspective. And you either do it through the social collateral or through individual underwriting. But you don't do that over the cell phone. Too much of a good thing can be bad. I think there are two, three underlying issues for that. We don't fully understand demand. And we need to all do more to understand it better. That's the first. The second is we had very rapid growth in these local markets. It's still few markets, but we had a, a rapid growth in a number of markets um, that led to uh, some led, that led to saturation. And what happened in that context is that we did not realize, as an industry and the individual MFIs did not realize, that the underlying challenge shifted on them from providing access to responsible delivery. And it happened faster because we probably overestimated demand. And some of the characteristics of, these fast, of the fast growth was sort of uh, a losing of credit discipline, 
uh, uh, maybe a, a, a not perfect functioning of the risk controls, if you will, uh, competition for the same segments, often the same geographies, small geographies, which uh, leads me to my th the third underlying reason is that we didn't have the the industry infrastructure in place to prevent some of this from happening. Most importantly, credit information sharing, so that we actually get a sense, uh, or that individual MFIs get a sense that they are not the only provider to a certain segment, but that there are a number of competing providers. So between not understanding fully the demand, fast growth, that uh, sort of eroded discipline, institutional discipline, and then a lack of market infrastructure that combined to these local market episodes um, of um, overlending and therefore multiple borrowing and, and over indebtedness. But it's very important to stress that this is still, these are early cases, and we will see probably more of those. But I just was in the Middle East where a regulator and a central bank governor told me, he said, uh, um, they said, listen, assets, microcredit as an asset is 0.03% of total assets in the economy and penetration might be 3%. So we cannot, this is a situation where we still have a white space and need access. So let's not kill that budding little thing called microfinance by overlaying too much of a sort of regulatory infrastructure, if you will, uh, that prevents it from going in the first place. What would be good is to immediately start at the same time building the market infrastructure, credit information sharing, etc., so that it is in place when the underlying challenge changes from providing access into white space to responsible delivery. We want to provide formal financial services to poor families in the informal economy. And what we provide to them better is better be better than the informal sector alternatives that are unreliable and more expensive. If what we do is not better, then we miss the bigger picture and the bigger point. So uh, to deliver uh, services uh, uh, across the board in a responsible fashion is a minimum starting point. We need the private sector to provide these services. And the notion of commercial versus non-commercial is a bit of a red herring in all of this. In order for this to be scalable and sustainable, all institutions have to make some type of profit whether they maximize and dividend out to shareholders or whether they make a profit and, and reinvest is a secondary issue, right? Even non-for-profits, no margin, no mission, mission as they say. So, uh, so the, 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 the clear notion is it has to be sustainable and, and, and profitable. Within the realms of consumer protection, do no harm, and if you attract subsidized money, maybe also with a promise to do specific good with respect to some social performance indicators. I think we have to pursue two paths. The very poorest ultimately um, have aspirations, dreams, and a variety of activities and therefore need access to financial services. But they might need to start with what we call a graduation program that's been pioneered by BRAC and others uh, around the world, where we start with an intervention that helps with livelihoods and uh, sort of establishes a, a uh, establishes sort of the viability of the household, if you will. And the, the successes of these programs are actually very, very encouraging. What we find is some of these other financial services are actually reaching so large numbers of the population that it does include the poor and the very poorest. So the M-Pesa, which is the first and most famous example of mobile money in Kenya, by now, and these numbers increase by the day, but by now reach 80% of the population. And by definition, that means it also reaches large numbers of the poor, which are actually the majority of the Kenyan population. 
uh, and, in, in, and it also reach, uh, uh, reaches some of the poorest. And what's interesting, it, it started as a many trans money transfer, pure payment mechanism, money transfer mechanism, but increasingly the poor uh, uh, and, and conceivably also the poorest use it for, to, store, uh, to store money. So send uh, themselves money before they go on a trip because it's very unsafe to carry cash with you and to withdraw the money at the end. And we have actually studies now that show there's a welfare impact, statistically significant demonstrable welfare impact that M-Pesa users have largely because they have access to money and remittances uh, in the sent from relatives in, in urban areas in moments of need when they for example need to make sure that they can actually buy a meal for the family or buy a medicine for medical reason. Why are we doing all this? It needs to do something good for either families or communities or for an economy as a whole. And the evidence that's coming in from the more recent set of studies is, is quite encouraging. So there are studies that show that, that, that savings allow for uh, higher business inventory and therefore higher uh, incomes for female market vendors in Kenya. There's evidence that insurance uh, crop insurance helps farmers to shift from subsistence to cash crops, use more fertilizers, use more land, have higher incomes and have impact on the family all the way to fewer school days skipped and fewer meals missed for the children. So the evidence is coming together quite nicely. That's at the household level. Then there are two more levels that are often interesting for policymakers and uh, uh, in the global arena. This, the, 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 the first of those two additional levels is that a financial system that reaches all its citizens allows for more effective other policy interventions, for example, in health or education. Um, in, in Brazil, the Bolsa Familia program shifted a number of its social welfare payments onto one electronic benefit card. And as a result of that effort, the cost of dispersing, the pure transaction cost of these programs uh, uh, reduced from 14.8% of total volume to 2.1%. That's a 12.7 point drop. That's huge because that's a 12.7 percentage savings on billions. And uh, when you make that calculation, finance ministers start listening. And then the third is at the macroeconomic level that goes beyond uh, the base of the pyramid. But we know that the depth of financial intermediation is positively correlated with growth and negatively correlated with inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. And that is actually a pretty well established uh, economic, uh, both theoretical and empirical literature. So between direct impact on households, if it is the appropriate product for the correctly understood underlying need at the policy effectiveness, enhancing the policy effectiveness of other interventions. And then at the macroeconomic level, there's quite a bit of development or growth impact to be had. And that's what we are very excited about. We have a lot to do. I think what's coming together is between a better understanding of what the underlying consumer needs are, what the latent demand if, is, if you will, uh, the experimentation with new business models that can reach more people with more products at far lower costs, and a better understanding of what's the type of enabling environment, pragmatically enabling environment that's required the right regulation, the right infrastructure, the right public goods, there's a body of knowledge coming together that actually allows us, I believe, in our lifetime to reach something like full financial inclusion. And that's probably uh, a, that, that's not what we can say in, in other fields of development. This is actually doable to some degree. There are always some people who might not want to be included financially. And certainly it doesn't mean that everybody needs access to all products. 
It just means that everybody has, if they need to, access to the appropriate products. We can achieve this in our lifetimes. Not in two years, but it also won't take 20 years.